Good morning. It's good to see you all on a beautiful Lord's Day with the uh, promise of the day becoming only more beautiful as the day goes on. That's a very good promise. This is, uh, this is the hardest season in Louisville for me. I kind of think winter's going to be winter. Summer's going to be summer. Fall is long. It's like a glide path on ending a flight. Uh, but whatever this is, spring, it just is inconsistent. It's, it's dishonest. I hate dishonest weather. <laughs> I, uh, I blame it for its blatant lies uh, that uh, just are not fulfilled. And uh, so anyway, we're, we'll, be, we'll be through it. We're told uh, today is the uh, pick day of the weekend. So what a way to start it as we have the opportunity to, to turn to God's Word together. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we are just so thankful for your constancy, your glory, your grace, your mercy, your love, your holiness. Father, all of these come fully into view in the text we face this morning. And we pray to face this text to receive all that you would give us to your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. The book of Leviticus is uh, highly structured. The first part of the book is about a code that centers in cleanliness. And of course, there are deep spiritual ramifications of this. How Israel will live, the laws by which Israel will live in social and in personal aspects will become far more clear in the latter chapters of Leviticus, in some ways better known to many Christians insofar as Leviticus is known. But one of the interesting issues we have to face is that right here, rather in the center of the book, in Leviticus chapter 16, we come face to face with the clearest presentation of the Day of Atonement, and in particular, the priestly responsibility for the Day of Atonement. Now, that requires a little bit of thought on our part. Why would we arrive now at the, at the Day of Atonement? Why not earlier or, for that matter, later? Why is it the hinge in this sense? And in order to understand that, we have to look backwards at Leviticus 10 and the death of Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. And remember, the sons of Aaron were slain as they had brought strange fire to the altar. And so we come to understand that atonement, the priestly work of atonement, it's a matter of life and death constantly. And this is something that is nearly, if not completely, missing from our vision. So what are the stakes of getting something wrong in a worship service at Third Avenue Baptist Church? Someone misreads a text. Someone gets something out of order. Uh, someone misses a verse to a hymn. I don't think I've been here when any of those things have actually happened. But it's, it's entirely possible, after all, we're fallible human beings, and uh, things can be misprinted in the order of worship. Uh, but we don't worry about anybody dying here. We, we, don't, we don't worry that if, uh, if the preacher says something that is even untrue, which we, we hope will be quickly corrected by that very preacher, is corrected by the text, or should accidentally say something. When I was a student at Sanford University, we had a program called H-Day. And you say, well, Sanford starts with an S. Yes, I know. But it used to start with an H because it was Howard College uh, before it became Sanford University. And you say, well, why would you change the name? Millions of dollars changes the name. But uh, the Ministerial Association, of which I was president at Sanford as a you know, teenager, actually, uh, we had a program where every Sunday an association in Alabama would be inflicted with the preacher boys from Sanford University. And uh, th they would take us and, and we would preach and they would give us feedback and, and food, which, by the way, at that point was more important than the feedback. But nonetheless, we, we did get feedback. But I had a good friend, and we were at the Etowah Association in Alabama, and I remember this extremely well. And he had evidently filled with his own teenage college student 
preaching fervor, reached a fever pitch in his sermon to announce that Jesus was not raised from the dead. He meant the opposite. Everybody knew he meant the opposite. And in the entire context of his message, just remember this, Jesus, he meant not defeated. He got not defeated and was raised confused. That's, that's bad. Homiletically, there's just nothing worse than that. <laughs> you know, it's like getting up saying, Jesus was defeated at Calvary. He was, it was just, 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 a, just a complete thing. And again, he was young. He didn't hear himself say it. So one of the things is, is that we met together. We all had a gathering place. We drove up just a couple of cars and and we would, we, and gathering place was usually a, a church. And but this kid came in; he was as bedraggled. He looked like he had just, as a friend of mine said, you know, they say out west, been uh, road hard and put up wet. He came in and he said, "You guys are not going to believe what I did. I undid the gospel." <laughs> I mean, it just, I just. But thankfully, you know, the pastor of the church is it make them get up and say, "I think what this young man, man meant was," and yes, got it cleaned up. But you know what? I remember it, and so far as I know, he's still alive, and he did not become a little grease spot on the floor, you know, at that point. We didn't drag him out of the car and bury his body outside the city gates, and uh, remember never to do that ourselves. We did remember never to do that ourselves, but with lesser consequences. It seems almost infinitely strange to us that this would be a matter of life and death. But this is life and death on behalf of an entire people whose very existence depends upon getting the ritual right. Because God, offended by sin, and in particular, offended by the sins of his covenant people, requires atonement. And he and not they set the terms of that atonement. By that atonement, they would survive and live. Look at how verse 1 of chapter 16 begins. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. Now, now wait just a minute. That's ten. That's chapter 10. That's six chapters before this. And now we have now the Lord spoke to Moses after this. So, Perhaps we're being given an an indication here by Moses himself that he has put this chapter by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we would know, in this place in order to pick up something that happened then. Or perhaps we needed to know everything from chapters 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 in order fully to understand what will come with chapter 16. Notice something else. The beginning of verse 1 in chapter 15, we read, we read when we were together last, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, but you notice now the Lord is speaking to Moses. Aaron is not hearing this. Aaron is to receive this as instruction from the Lord through Moses. The Lord is not inviting Aaron to be a part of this conversation. And a part of it is because he's going to describe the conditions under which Aaron and those who will follow him as the priest will die if they do not absolutely and scrupulously follow the requirements of the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. Now, again, just understand something of what we're looking at here. Israel is at this point... A covenant people, the covenant that has been made, in this case with Moses, a covenant that included the exodus of of Israel itself out of Egypt, but now a sojourn, a long wandering in the wilderness, and a situation in which Israel is God's covenant people, but just understand the incongruity of this. They are of all the peoples of the earth, the most blessed, the most honored to have been chosen by God of all the other peoples of the earth as his covenant people. 
And, and yet you have the Egyptians who have an empire in Egypt, and of course at the same time you have various other throughout the, the arc of Mesopotamia going across in the fertile crescent of Africa. You, you have civilizations here and civilizations there. You have palaces and farms and cultivated gardens. Israel is in the middle of a desert that offers so little sustenance that they are kept alive only by manna in the morning. And, and to them are given these instructions. But of course, these instructions, and we keep this in mind, especially as we move forward in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, these are instructions given for Israel when Israel will inhabit the land of promise. But what we see here is that the stakes are pretty high about them even getting there. If, if Aaron ever enters into this place, and as we shall see, there is one exception, the exception is coming, but if Aaron should ever enter into this most holy place, he'll simply die, along with his sons. This, this will be the, the, the Aaronic priesthood basically wiped out, and at this point, it is interesting that the Lord is saying these things to Aaron, and Moses is to mediate these things, spoken by the Lord, to Aaron, his brother. And the stakes here are not just for Aaron, they're for, for all of Israel. Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. Now, you see the stakes are rising here. And, and if... One of the great blessings of our consideration of Leviticus is that we say, okay, now I understand Christ and, and, and Christ only is his person as, as, as Messiah, as the one who would, as the Son of God, make atonement. I understand him as the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. I, I understand him as the great high priest, as we're going to see. There is no passage which makes these issues so clear as where we are today. The mercy seat. And again, as we were looking, even going verse by verse through Exodus, and you think this, the mercy seat, there on the Ark of the Covenant, there, there is this place where something is going to happen with the sprinkling of blood that will, that will bring about an occasion. The forgiveness of the sins of Israel. A forgiveness of sins, a mercy an atonement that is so desperately needed and necessary. The Lord went on to say, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. So where the Lord's presence is, the priest is not to be. Now again, we just kind of move over that. We say, yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true. You look at, the, you look at the tabernacle, you look at the temple, the presence of the Lord is here, the people are there. The presence of the Lord is here, one day of the year, one human being enters into that presence in the most holy place, the holy of holies. But God's presence is there, and then you have these concentric chambers within the tabernacle and within the temple, and by the time you get to where we would be sitting, the Lord's presence is not there. But notice how we sing, you know, you know, in your presence, praise. We sing about coming into the Lord's presence. We, we have hymns that talk about coming into the presence of the Lord. Not to mention all the texts of Scripture that tell us about coming into the presence of the Lord. How do we do that? I mean, we turn them into Sunday school songs. How do we, how do, we do that? Well, you and I both know, and we're fast-forwarding here, that that is because on the day that Christ was crucified... As the very Son of God, the sinless Son of God, the perfect spotless Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. When He was crucified, the veil in the temple was rent. And so we are in the presence of God. We are not excluded, but it's not because of anything in us. It is because of the obedience of Christ. But we're not there yet. We're with we're with. Israel in the wilderness. And remember all the specifications that were in Exodus about how the, the, the most holy place was to be constructed and the furnishings in the most holy place and, of course, the ark itself and the, the mercy seat on the, on the ark. And, and then if you just take where we are in chapter 16 at this point, nobody can go in there anyway. It's going to make it very hard to move this thing. 
It's going to make it much harder to imagine how forgiveness takes place. Then he says this, For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat, the end of verse 2, and then verse 3, but in this way Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So a lot of animals involved in this. In verse 6, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. So once again, this is one of the most amazing things we have to recognize, is that if you are going to have a human priesthood instrumental in inviting and invoking God's atonement, then that priesthood is going to have to be prepared. An awful lot of, of, of the attentiveness of the people is going to have to be to the fact that the, the priest himself will have to make reference to his own sin. Now, this, this shows up in the book of Hebrews where we are told that Christ entered the most holy place not with reference to his own sin, for he was sinless. But this is not a sinless high priest. This is just a human high priest. This is just Aaron and those who will be Aaron's descendants, and they are sinners just as every other one, and so they have to be washed. That's not enough. They have to put on the, the particular priestly garments. That's not enough. Even the undergarments, lest anything should happen that might soil. You can't have that happen to the outer garments. So there are these priestly inner garments that are to be worn, and, uh, and yet n none of this is enough. There has to be now atonement made by sacrifice. In verse 11, Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself and he shall take a censer full of coals from the fire uh, from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small. That's the most intense smell, by the way, is when the, so you have the, you have the, uh, the, the, the items of the incense broken into a finer, which means more aromatic mixture. And he shall bring it inside the veil and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony so that he does not die. And the testimony is the sacrifice. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side, and the front of the mercy seat, on it, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. So all this is a ritual just to remind Israel and to remind the high priest of the necessity, first of all, of making sacrifice with reference to his own sin. Now again, in the book of Hebrews, as we shall see, in, in this marvelous text, so central to our understanding of the atonement that only makes sense in light of Leviticus because then you'll notice that we're told that Christ enters the most holy place not with reference to his own sin. So the book of Hebrews directly comes back to a text just like Leviticus chapter 16 and says, yeah, here's the difference. Aaron had to make sacrifice with reference to his own sin because he was a sinner. Christ, no sin. No sacrifice with reference to his own sin. Verse 15 continues, Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, that is, for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting, which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. So now the worship area itself on behalf of the children of Israel has to be cleaned. It has to be cleansed because of their constant sin. And so there's more blood, and it's sprinkled on the mercy seat. Again, that's putting it before the presence of the Lord. In verse 
18, then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around and he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people of Israel. Now you'll notice this is singular as you go back to verse 17. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Look at the, the, at the reason why in verse 16. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. So this becomes known as Yom Kippur, this uh, day of atonement. And it becomes absolutely necessary. On this one day, the high priest commissioned by God would enter into the most holy place where we are told he was never to enter lest he die. And, and lest, by the way, the people would die because their priest will have died and their sins thus would remain upon them. Well, this one day he enters in, but under these very, very particular circumstances and with a very complicated sacrificial strategy, strategy of sacrifices that are first with reference to his own sin, and, and then again in the New Testament, this will come up again. We're told that Christ died as a, as, as a sacrifice, not with reference to his own sin, because he was sinless. That's the, that's the categorical infinite distinction between the sacrifice of the new covenant and the sacrifice of the old covenant. This is going to have to happen every year. You'll notice that the ritual includes the number seven several times over. Again, the, the, the number of God's structure of the creation, seven days of creation, it is a number that points to perfection and to divine order. So the seven, the structure of the week, it just comes up again and again and again. In verse 20, and when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all of their transgressions, all of their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all the iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Now here we have the scapegoat. A word that has been carried into our literature into our legal arenas, just in terms of our vernacular, a scapegoat. What do we do with this, uh, this goat? In one sense, its literal name is the goat that goes away. It's kind of the escape goat. It's a goat that's live. And what we have here is a doctrine of imputation. This becomes very, very crucial in the New Testament to our understanding of the atonement accomplished by Christ once for all. It is a double imputation. To impute is to declare to be true of one of whom it would not be true without the declaration. Our sin is imputed to Christ on the cross. His righteousness is imputed to us by God's grace and mercy. That's, that's the double imputation. So that when God looks to us who are in Christ, we who are in Christ, he does not see our sin, but he sees his son's own righteousness. That's that double imputation. A single imputation would not lead to atonement or would not lead to our salvation. It takes a double imputation. It's in one sense an exchange imputation. Christ takes our sin, we take his righteousness, but we have no right to take it. It has to be imputed to us. We are entirely passive. This scapegoat on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, 
This scapegoat is, in one sense, a living sacrifice. But a living sacrifice completely cut off from the people. There is an imputation when the high priest puts his hands on the head of this goat, and, and by God's decree, the sins of Israel at that time are imputed to this goat. And the goat is not slain. It is cast out into the wilderness to wander. So even that's not a, an absolutely completed atonement. It's one of the things we note about the atonement that comes under the Old Covenant. It's an atonement that's real, but for now, and it's, it's not eternal, it's not final. The very people who accomplish the sacrifice will sin in the course of the very day in which they perform the sacrifice. Even the high priest who has to make Sacrifice, first of all, with reference to his own sin. And again, you, you look at the New Testament, it tells us that Christ was crucified as a sacrifice, but not with reference to his own sin, for he was sinless. This goat becomes a metaphor. The, the, this, this goat, to this goat is imputed. That is, by God's decree, the, the sins of the people are put on this goat. This miserable animal is then taken outside of the gate, outside of the community, and wanders. So out there, during the time that Israel was following the, the covenant and the requirements of the covenant, even as we see here, even as Israel, under its priesthood, was observing the Day of Atonement, for all of those centuries, every single year on the Day of Atonement, some vile goat was chosen from all others to bear the imputed sin of the entire Jewish people and to be cast out into the wilderness. The word scapegoat thus has entered into our common parlance as someone who bears uh, scandal or, uh, or judgment on behalf of others. Well, there is no scapegoat like the actual scapegoat, who after all wasn't even another human being, just, just a, a goat, an animal to whom was imputed all the sins of Israel for a year and then cast out into the wilderness. Now, our imaginations can't help but fast forward many different times so that when we, we think about the wilderness, for instance, in the New Testament, we think about John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. We think about Jesus going into the wilderness. Just remember, the wilderness is the place where the scapegoat went. We continue. Verse 23, then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall bathe his body in water in a holy place and put on his garments and come out and offer the burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement, notice these words, for himself and for the people. So again, a sinful priest has to make atonement, first of all, with reference to his own sin, and then for the sins of the people. And we're told again and again, that is exactly what Christ does not do. No atonement with reference for his own sin, for he is sinless. And the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar. And he who lets the goat go to Aziel shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water. And afterward he may come into the camp. So you'll notice this is... a. It's kind of like proximity, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's, it's third and fourth hand. It's, a, it's, it's concentric circles, we may say, uh, of, uh, of theological risk. Theological risk. 
So the person who has any contact, even with taking the scapegoat out into the wilderness and letting him go, he now has been close to that animal and close to that sin. So you have the ablutions, you have the washings, you have the, the amount of time that is necessary before such a person can even come back into the community. There's atonement to be made. And he shall bathe his body in water, verse 24, in a holy place, and put on his garments, and come out and offer his burnt offering, and the burnt offering of the people, and make atonement for himself and for the people, and the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar. So you see, again, this is, a, this is an aromatic um, sacrifice, so the people would not see, but they would smell. They would, they would kind of be able to trace what's happening by the smell of what would be coming from the altar. And thus you have the one who lets the goat go, having to bathe his body. And then verse 27, and the bull for the sin, sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Their skin and their flesh and their dung shall be burned up with fire. And he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water. And afterward he may come into the camp. Again, you, you've got to keep all this straight because... Here's something to think about. Once you have a scapegoat, and remember that's a live animal, it's a live goat. Once you have a scapegoat, it's going to be let loose into the wilderness. You do not want that goat coming back into the camp. The sin is on that goat. That goat needs to go far, far, far away. And, and just to make that point, even someone proximate to the goat is now unclean and has to wash before coming back into the camp. The same thing is true of the animals who on the Day of Atonement are sacrificed. Even their skin, even what remains of their flesh. And don't miss the reference to their dung. All that has to be dealt with the same way. This is something we just don't think about. And we need to realize, by God's grace and mercy, what liberation and grace and blessing there is to us and not having to worry about this. I, I look out this morning and uh, you guys look pretty good. But I have no idea that any of you or any of us would be qualified to have anything to do with any of this. And here's the other thing, to, again, to keep in mind, that people they're in the wilderness who are living a subsistence existence, simply kept alive by the Lord, and are in a place so inhospitable that it's, it's unlikely that any could stay as they would for 40 years and survive. They're going to have to spend hours and hours and hours, untold hours a day, just giving attentiveness to these things, lest they offend the Lord and die. You know, this morning we got up, we got ourselves ready, and we came to church. I dare say it is unlikely that any of you came with terror that had you missed one step or forgotten one sin, you might well have died as you walked into this place. It's one of the reasons, by the way, that I push back on uh, second great awakening excesses. You say, well, that's a big jump. <clears throat> we got from... Leviticus to second great awakening excesses. Well, here is, here is a problem. This is not an altar. If it is, we are in big trouble. If this is an altar, we have one of two and maybe both deadly misconceptions. The first misconception is that we have entered, as we come into this place, a temple or a tabernacle. We have not. We've entered into a meeting place. That's all this is. <laughs> all this is is a meeting place. An altar represents a sacrifice. And you say, well, that's what we're called to. We're called to be living sacrifices according to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Yes, that's true. But that doesn't speak to a place in a room that we would call an altar. And the 
A lot of this comes out of the Second Great Awakening and the altar call, which is when you had people who would be called to make a response, and, and one of the excesses of the Second Great Awakening, it, it's not wrong to call for a response. The, 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 the excess was in believing that you could judge the efficacy of preaching or of worship or of an event by how much response was visible. Now, clearly, we look for visible response to the gospel. That's, that's, but, but what we look for in visible response to the gospel is accomplished, satisfied, and fulfilled in what we shall see this morning, and that is in the baptism of new believers. But uh, in the Second Great Awakening, especially in the influence of people like Charles Finney, the, the, there was the, the, the suggestion that what you had here was an altar. You come to the altar to pray. You bring your uh, prayer request to the altar. You would, uh, you'd have an altar call, otherwise known as an invitation. But that is a piece of wooden furniture. That's all it is. It's just in the front of the pulpit. And it is a place to put the elements of the Lord's Supper, which is a memorial of a sacrifice. It is not a sacrifice. It is not a mass. It is not an atonement. That atonement was made, has been made, infinitely and perfectly by our great high priest. And that altar, as the book of Hebrews tells us, is not on earth but in heaven. And so we're, we're, we're seeking to avoid misunderstanding what's going on here. But we just need to feel, as we look at Leviticus chapter 16, the mercy of Christ in the fact that we do not think about these things. And uh, it also points out that... Uh, if the sacrifice has to happen over and over and over and over and over again, it's not done. Salvation is not done. And that points to one of the central errors of the Roman Catholic Church, where the Mass is a sacrifice. And the, by even the, the claimed doctrine of transubstantiation, it is Christ crucified again. And that's exactly what the reformers understood was an attempt to deny the gospel and to go back under the tabernacle and the covenant of old. Well, here we are. Leviticus chapter 16. In verse 29, and it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you, for on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all of your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make atonement, wearing the holy linen garments. He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priest and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be a statute forever for you, that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. Here the day of atonement. Several things for us to think about. We need to look back to Exodus chapter 25. the mercy seat. Let's look at verses 17 and following. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end, one cherub on the other end, of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces to one another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, 
I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. Now, in one sense, what we just read is a partial fulfillment of that very passage as the Lord is giving instructions to Moses. As Moses, remember, is not to do this. Moses doesn't enter this place. Moses is not a priest. Moses is here, again, a mediator, little m. He is a mediator of God's revelation to the priest, to Aaron, his brother, and to those who will follow in Aaron's line in the priesthood and fulfill this Levitical duty. And, and that's what's absolutely crucial here is for us to understand that God's word on something as central and urgent and essential to this to Israel has to be mediated even through Moses to Aaron. The Lord did not say these things directly to Aaron, but rather to Moses to be communicated to Aaron. Now, for the great satisfaction of our souls, let's fast forward to Romans chapter 3. So how do we understand Christ in light of this and Christ's atonement? Look at chapter 3 of the book of Romans, beginning in verse 21. But now, again, a characteristic Pauline New Testament, New Covenant way of saying, now, as contrasted with everything that came before, New Covenant is contrasted with old. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Specifically, Paul means, verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, just stop there for a moment. That promise language, which is accomplished here, which is definitive of Christianity, is completely missing in Leviticus. So this is a part of God's new covenant reality that is brought to us in and only in Christ. This very clear language of being justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Then look at verse 25. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. Now when did He do that? On the Day of Atonement. Even in what we just saw. So why did all that take place? Quote, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So the only atonement that could save us from our sins, not just the forbearance by which God would delay the outpouring of his wrath, but the final accomplishment of the imputation of our sins to Christ and Christ's righteousness to us, imputed to us, uh, for, for that to happen, God has to not only require the sacrifice, but to provide the sacrifice. And there is no sacrifice on earth. There is no goat. There is no bull. There is no calf. And here's the other realization. There is no human being who can bear the sins of humanity, but the God-man, who is infinitely righteous and in whom there is no sin. As we're thinking about how to understand these things, finally, we turn to the book of Hebrews, let's look particularly at Hebrews chapter 9. This entire section of Hebrews, of course, pointing to Christ as our great high priest. But feel the soul satisfaction of hearing this in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, beginning in verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, that, ha that have come, not to come, the good things that have come, 
Then through the greater, more perfect tent, so this is not the tabernacle made with human hands, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sacrifices for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So there we have the ultimate statement in the New Testament of the fulfillment of Leviticus, even the passage we just saw on the Day of Atonement. So when we come together, when is our Day of Atonement? Well, our Day of Atonement was on that Friday we dare to call good. Even with the celebration in particular, the annual celebration of the resurrection of Christ coming before us. And as we think through the events of the week that we in the Christian church traditionally have called the Holy Week, as we think about Christ in the city, we think about Christ on the cross, we think about Christ being buried outside the gate, and we think about Christ raised from the dead. It's all about the fact that what Christ did in his atonement by the plan and purpose of the Father was that he entered a tabernacle not made with human hands and made the infinitely total sacrifice by his righteousness. He shed his blood for the remission of our sins in an infinitely perfect redemption. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant. So in this sense, we look back to the old and you say, who was the mediator of that old covenant? It was Moses. And you know, if all we have is the old covenant, Moses is as much of a mediator as we've got. But thanks be to God, we have a mediator infinitely greater than Moses who could go where no Aaronic priest could ever go, into that tabernacle not made with human hands. And he took not the blood of an animal, but shed his own blood for the remission of our sins. He was raised by the power of the Father on the third day, and he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Now, if that doesn't make you happy on this beautiful Lord's Day, what would? I'm astounded by Leviticus chapter 16, coming as that hinge in the book. And evidently, by God's purpose, we needed the first 15 chapters of Leviticus in order to understand and even hunger for and find satisfaction in the 16th chapter in the Day of Atonement. But as a Christian, I'm not struck by the satisfaction I find in Leviticus chapter 16. I'm struck by the satisfaction I do not find there a satisfaction we find only in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful for all you've given us in your word. Thank you for giving us the book of Leviticus. Thank you for the chapters that yet remain that will be instructive to us about the holiness of your people. And our Father, thank you for Christ, whom we have seen displayed in hunger and thirst and anticipation and infinite need in Leviticus chapter 16. Father, thank you for making provision for your people in the wilderness. And infinitely, Father, we safely into your presence and making way for us to survive, even to live forever in the name of Christ. Father, may you be glorified every day of our lives and in this church, in this Lord's day today, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.